Hey everyone, Kaijin Kumba here, and welcome back to Culture Shock! We break down your favorite games and anime to discover the culture that inspired them. And yes, you read that title correctly. We are finally talking about something other than Japanese culture today! Instead, we're traveling from one island nation to another halfway across the world to break down some of our favorite nods to the UK found in Pokemon Sword and Shield. But first, a few caveats. One, where our other video on Pokemon, the Gala region, and Britain were more speculative, what we're discussing today are absolute game spoilers on certain Pokemon, items, events, and places. So, if you're having to hold out till Christmas to experience the game fresh, tread lightly. And two, as Japan and the rest of East Asia are more of our wheelhouse, we're sadly going to have to play the dumb American card and preface this video with the fact that we don't British English good. That's why we brought in one of our English officers from our community, Mordo. Hi everyone, my name's Mordo and I help Gaijin with the research for this video. I also hang out in the Gaijin stream so you can catch me there whenever he streams. But for now, let's get into the culture shop to see if Game Freak are taking the mickey or not. With that, we've been racking our brains about what in the world to talk about when it comes to the British influences in Pokemon Sword and Shield. I mean, they're freaking everywhere. From geographical locations to even something as simple as everyday slang. This game is so chock a blocked with so much limey cod swap that even Mordo had trouble knowing his onions about it. Are you okay? Sorry, this game just kind of sucks you into it. So, instead of hammering home one particular thing that caught our fancy, we're going to break down all of our favorite British-inspired Pokemon, in no particular order, that left us absolutely gobsmacked when we figured out what they were actually on about. Seriously, cut that out. Fine, fine. Let's start with something simple, like Dorelodon. Odd thing this lad, a dragon steel type unique to Galar whose body quote resembles polished metal both lightweight and strong and the only drawback is that it rusts easily, as well as being made from a quote special metal that makes its body very lightweight so the Pokemon has considerable agility. And apparently it lives in caves because it dislikes rain. Well that doesn't make any sense. The only place you can reliably find this guy is at a 1% overworld spawn rate in Route 10 during a freaking ice storm. Well, pull back a bit because it's not Duraludon's habitat that makes it so interesting. This guy is literally just nothing more than a living representation of the largest building in London, the Shard, with its elongated pyramid shape and its large spikes coming out the top. Yeah, look familiar? And if that wasn't enough, its Gigantamax form, which is literally a freaking building, shares a near identical style of not only the tip spikes near the head of this guy, but the similar window paneling going down its front. Finally, unlike other skyscraping buildings predominantly made of steel and concrete, the Shard, living up to its name, is comprised of over 11,000 panels of glass, which might explain the design of Duraludon's underbelly. Well, as for me, I'm more of a fantasy fiction guy myself, and I absolutely lost it when I first saw Surfetched. I mean, there's the obvious reasons, like how much raw dapper energy this boy emanates, but there's a few little folklore bits that may have gone over some people's heads. Like the fact that Surfetched is literally Sir Lancelot. And no, I don't just mean because he's carrying around a lance and shield like old English knights of yore would do, though that's still a reference. I'm talking color. In the classic tales of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, before he was known as Lancelot du Lark, Lancelot bore no coat of arms and was simply known as the White Knight before he revealed his true identity to Arthur. Oh, and speaking of his full name, Lancelot du Lark, it literally means Lancelot of the Lake. And guess what routinely lives in lakes? Not bad, not bad. But how about this one? Skolvit and Greedent. Pull the other one! No, I'm serious. This is actually a very subtle nod to a near extinction of the UK's Red Squirrel. For over 10,000 years, Red Squirrel populations were spread all across England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. Nowadays, though, the only Red Squirrels left in the UK reside in a few scant locations in Northern England, Scotland, and a few parts of Ireland. Reason being is that the Grey Squirrel, which is technically an invasive species from the States, was brought over in the late 1800s. And it turns out that gray squirrels are eating the red squirrels out of literal house and home due to their apparent superior intelligence. As for our squirrel Pokemon, their very names are synonymous with greed, but here's the curious thing. What does the deck say about our gray squirrel Squovit? Yeah, pretty obsessed with finding food and being smart about how to get it. Now, how about the red squirrel Pokemon Greedent? Yeah, apparently it's so slow-witted that it's actually losing food. A difference in intelligence? How about that crap? Oh, that freaking reminds me! Intelligence? Inteleon, the James Bond chameleon, or double O Gecko as I like to call him. While yes, this lanky lad could be a generic shoutout to MI6 in general, what with its name like Inteleon, the secret agent Pokemon, and this boy's sniping capabilities, but you cannot for a minute convince me that this is not a James Bond shoutout. For one, gadgets. Gadgets galore! 
because it's not simply the fact that Intellion can fire sniper shots, it's how he fires them from his hands. Sounds like a gadget right out of Q's lab, right? I mean, the man's put guns on everything from pins to cigarettes. And how about that hang glider attached to its back? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And tell me, who's the king of hang gliding that defies all physics? Finally, if all of that didn't convince you, there's one thing that will. Getting back to actual science, there's actually four Pokemon that highlights one of the biggest scientific scandals in the UK that lasted for almost a century. While transversing Route 6 to get to Stow on side, you eventually run into Carolis and... Oh, already this isn't looking good. A mismatched half-awake scientist that can combine Pokemon fossils into their quote original form. Dracozolt, Arctozolt, Dracovish, and Arctovish. But, uh, you see a problem here? Yeah, it's very obvious that these Pokemon were slapdash together in an attempt to discover ancient Pokemon species, and the Dex even tries to legitimize it, despite the fact that these things are walking abominations. Well, this is a not-so-subtle nod to the Piltdown Man. In 1912, British archaeologist Charles Dawson claimed that he had found the missing link between man and ape, finding a skull, jawbone, teeth, and primal tools near Piltdown in East Sussex. This set the Geological Society of London ablaze with excitement as the fossils were reconstructed into Dawson's Dawn Man, a 500,000-year-old ancestor to humanity. That is until 1953 when the question of authenticity came into play. Turns out the jawbone of this proto-man was actually that of an orangutan while the skull was that of a modern man. But it wasn't until 2003 that Charles Dawson's career was exposed, and not until freaking 2016 that an extensive study proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Dawn Man was a complete forgery. Not so unlike the mismatched tops and bottoms of these Pokemon. Speaking of forgeries, there's a new ghost Pokemon in town who acts as a slant against the UK's underground porcelain racket. I'm sorry, what? For real, both Sinistee and Poltegeist are examples of one of the biggest forgery rings in the UK. Look at these two Sinisties. They look identical, right? Well, if you look underneath their base, see that? One with the mark and one without. Though this doesn't change the stats between the two in any way, the Pokemon without the mark is a 100% forgery of the real Pokemon. Not only that, but between Sinistee and Poltegeist, there's actually four sets of dex entries. One in each of Sword and Shield for the forgery, and one in each for the real deal. But why would Pokemon go through all that trouble for something so small, you might be asking? Well, you might also want to ask that to all the folks in the UK during the 1800s who were swindled into purchasing forgery porcelain thought to have come from prestigious brands. You know, if they were still alive. For 2,000 years, the secret to creating porcelain was one of China's greatest secrets and was one of the highest imported goods from China to England, second only to black tea. But all of that changed in the 18th century when German scientist Johann Friedrich Butter cracked the formula. After that, he was off to the races. But with the hype of domesticated porcelain came new ways for people to exploit it. For example, in 1848, Francis Edgewood of Josiah Edgewood and Sons Etruria took out an injunction against William Smith & Co. where they were apparently faking the Wedgwood mark. Basically one of history's oldest copyright claims. And even to this day, there are still issues of authenticity when it comes to porcelain collectors. Lucky for us, we can spot a fake Sinistee with a simple brand. In real life, you have to do everything from inspecting color, to weight, to even the gloss of the item to figure out if it's real or not. Well, let's move on to something a little more open-ended. Galarian Meowth and its new evolution, Berserker. Now, one look at this little gremlin and you're thinking, okay, Gaijin, this one isn't exactly rocket science. Both these guys are Vikings. You know, Scandinavian raiders who challenged their way through modern-day England, such as Guthrum's invasion of Wessex. But let me ask you something, people. Why Meowth of all Pokemon? See, here's where things get interesting. So we all know Freya, right? Norse goddess of love, fertility, gold, etchy time, etc. Well, her specialized chariot was not pulled by two horses like so many other figures of myth, but rather two cats. And not like lynxes or anything exotic, we're talking regular cats. Beagle and Treagle. Now, the Pantheon, just like you, were wondering, why cats? After all, Odin had an eight-legged horse, and Freya's brother Freyr rode on a freaking golden boar. But it was the fact that Thor himself gave them to her that she chose to make them her companion animals. So yeah, two cats, two cats. Makes sense. Now there's a few other things that I could mention, such as Meowth's type changing to steel, which reflected the historical account of Vikings using animal and ancestral bones to make their iron weapons stronger and thus accidentally creating steel. But it's specifically Berserker that I want to address because this change from Persian to Berserker is symbolic to the Vikings' most brutal warrior. Uh-huh, the Berserker. Let me paint a picture for you. 
Take a Viking, a badass in his own right. Now, put an animal mantle on him and convince him that he has the primal power of a bear, wolf, or boar. Now, to help convince him of that, let's get him really hammered on alcohol, or better yet, super high using herbal drugs. And you know what? For good measure, let's just strip him down almost naked alongside his self-induced hysteria of biting his shield and howling like an animal. With some discrepancies, that is a Viking Berserker. A warrior without fear, only rage, whose augmented bloodlust was so strong that should he survive the fight, he would never be emotionally the same again. Compare that with Perserker and its blood red eyes and terrifying battle cry animation? Yeah, I think the name fits pretty well. Speaking of Norse culture, there's just one more Pokemon we gotta talk about before we wind up this episode. Rune Regis. I mean, this design might seem stereotypically basic, but it's actually modeled after one of the most important aspects of Viking culture. Rune Stones. See, spirituality in Viking culture was so ingrained that they had no word for religion, and there was no separation between faith and reality. And these rune stones are examples of how close the Vikings were to their beliefs. Rune stones typically commemorate the lives of notable people and events, but they're more than just simple mural pieces. They had mystical powers as they were ingrained on amulets, beads, and shields to convey powers of protection, success, victory, and so on. And as you might expect, the profession of rune casting was one of very high regard in the Viking community. This is why the Shield Dex entry of Rune Regis states that if you touch it, you'll see the horrific memories that commemorate it. That's kind of the point behind Rune Stones. Commemorating events as well as possessing supernatural power. There is so much more that we could talk about, but it would literally take us months to include every little Britishism that made us double take. So instead, I invite you guys to tell me your favorite snippets of UK culture found in Sword and Shield. But before you do, let me just quickly make mention that for the holidays, we're bringing back a bunch of our limited time merch, as well as tons of new stuff based on everything from folklore creatures we've talked about in our videos, to even the Galarian coughing you saw in this video's thumbnail. Yeah, it's so much wasted opportunity not to have that in game. Anyway, if interested, check out the link in the description to get to my store, and thanks for watching everyone! There's potentially going to be a lot more Pokemon and yes, even Digimon related videos that we're going to be cranking out from December to January. So be sure to subscribe, get notified, and keep an eye out on our channel page for the newest editions of Culture Shock, Witch Ninja, and Yokai Hunters. But until next time everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.